Hey, good morning, Gladwood Free Methodist Church. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's so good to hear you visiting with one another and uh, encouraging one another. Uh, we are always grateful to be together uh, here in person and when we can't be uh, online uh, as well. And so those of you who are online, we welcome you uh, with us as well. Um, and I'm going to pray and then uh, Sue and a friend has an announcement uh, uh, as well. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning uh, for this time set aside to come together to worship you and glorify your name. We praise you for the ability to be here, that you brought us together here uh, for this purpose of worshiping you. We praise you for the joy uh, in the conversations we have had with one another as well, Lord. Uh, and Father, we, we, we set aside this time uh, and set aside the thoughts and the distractions that are uh, in our head, in our mind, on our heart, uh, and just commit this time to you, whether it be through song or the hearing or the preaching of your word, Lord, uh, we seek your face today. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Call it a little bit of an audible here, but when the spirit moves, you follow, right? Um, earlier this week, I was reflecting and, and sharing with some folks in a time of devotion uh, from what I would consider to be, I guess, my favorite verse in the Bible, and that's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And it says this, it says, For God did not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. And as we were talking through the, the devotion, uh, we talked about that when we find ourselves afraid, we know automatically if it didn't came, come from God, it came from Satan, right? There's no in-between. And so when we find ourselves afraid, we can reject that and let go of that and look at, okay, what does it mean to live in these circumstances with power, love, and self-control? And I believe the Word of God is every bit as practical as it is spiritual, don't you? And so it makes sense in those moments to set aside what we're afraid of and think about and actually decide for ourselves, choose what it means to live with power, love, and self-control in those times of fear. And speaking the name of Jesus is such a huge part of setting aside and rejecting that fear. I couldn't help myself up at the altar here to, to pray for our entire church whether you're a part of our church family or whether you're visiting, it doesn't matter. God loves you all the same. Uh, and to pray for us that, because I know, I know that amongst us, probably the majority of us are carrying fear about something. That we would let loose of that, that we would reject that. And claim out of our, our citizenship in the kingdom of God, a spirit of power and love and self-control. Many of you, when you got the call last night about Peyton, I'm sure were terrified. I was. But that's not from God. Because he had her. And that doesn't mean that, that bad things don't happen, right? These things do. But it's our response, the Christian response to living in the world today. So my, my prayer for you, and I have no idea how this does or doesn't fit with your message. I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my prayer for you today is, is that as you sit here, whatever comes to mind when you hear me talk about that thing you're afraid of, you just let loose of it. Throw it on the pew. I don't care. Throw it on the floor. Whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Right? Because this is the house of the Lord, this is the body of believers, and fear has no place here. All right, I'll stop now. Amen. That's, um, there's power in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. 
Amen. And we've been in this series called Repairing the Altar. And Repairing the Altar, you know, we get... Uh, I was re- reflecting back a little bit, especially when you're in a time of transition, and I realized how young I was when I came here. <laughs> and some of you remember when I was young, and all I can say is, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, I learned very quickly that there's power in the name of Jesus. And, um, but I also know and, and you become aware of when you look back, when you've been walking with the Lord for a number of years, when you look back, you become aware of there have been so, there have been seasons where you try to build your altar on your own effort. You know? And I think about Elijah and uh, when he rebuilt the altar where the sacrifice was going to be that God burned up with fire that we, we began this series with, right? And I, think, and I think about how he physically had to move those stones and rebuild them and And get it all prepared. But then I think about this image. The rebuilding of the altar in my heart looks exactly the opposite. I need to tear down all the stuff I built up and the walls I built up that are that are things I'm trying to do to be right. And tear those down and say, Lord, fill me with your presence and your powers. That's the beautiful thing Jesus did for us on the cross of Christ. He made it not about the, just the, the physical place. He made it about the position of our heart toward Him, where we can know Him. You know, so that's what it's about. So when you think about this, and when you think about this title, it's not about what you do, it's about what you let Jesus do in you, and that changes what you do. And it begins with our love of God. When we love God with everything. And we depend on him with everything. So let's, let's pray one more time. Father, I thank you for the power of the name of Jesus. I thank you for uh, your presence that's here. Lord, we pray every week that we would know of your presence and your power. And Lord, you, you always show up. But Lord, sometimes we miss it because we're, uh, we're just uh, thinking about what we want to do next. We're thinking about our Whatever. About our dish that is simmering in the other room for the potluck later. Doesn't matter. All right? But Lord, we want, to, we want to be engaged in what you're doing because your presence is here. Help us to have our hearts turned toward you, our minds turned toward you. I pray that you'd help me to share your word and your truth your way. Help me not to be an error. Lord, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm human, Lord. And, but Lord, in, in the event where I make a mistake or an error, Lord, may you teach me and may you teach us and may your Holy Spirit speak to us and show us what it is truth and what is of you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be again uh, looking at 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Joy uh, reading and studying and, and thinking about the prophet Elijah. I, I enjoy these passages of Scripture, and when I read them, I, I find different things and new things from them very often. But I, I want to go to chapter 19. I know uh, our, our text says um, uh, verses 10 through 21. I want to just give us a reminder of some of the background. So remember, Elijah had the showdown with the prophets of Baal, and all that happened, and there was this um, this period of, you know, in the Old Testament, the prophets have to be part of carrying out God's judgment and wrath sometimes. And it's a terrible thing to read about. And that is something that takes place. And then as you're reading from that, Elijah's responding to that. And he's overwhelmed with what he's witnessed. And he's overwhelmed with anxiety and fear and depression. And he begins to run. I mentioned last week he would have been a great marathon runner. Um, he ran a lot. I want to, so just for, just for purpose of background, verse 7 says this, Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time. Elijah is he's in the desert. He's, he's run several miles. He's, he's just feeling like he's all alone. But that's okay. We need those times sometimes. 
Our culture says if you feel sad or feel alone that it's a bad place. I'm telling you, it's not a bad place. It doesn't have to be a bad place because you're not alone. And God shows up when we listen to him. And Elijah has the presence of mind when he's feeling that way to call out to God. The Bible says in verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected their covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore, through the, mount, tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled the cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, over the king of Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, and as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Elijah said, I'm the only one left, Lord. I'm doing this alone. And the Lord said, there are 7,000 of Israel who have not bowed down. There are 7,000 who are still faithful. You are not alone. I have a note in my Bible I wrote several years ago there. It says, you are not alone. It's written in red. I wrote it there. And it must have really been important to me because I can actually read what I wrote there. It says, you are not alone. Today is what we call Super Mission Sunday. It's a time when we're reminded that God calls you and I, his followers, his church, to be on this mission, fulfilling his purposes, bringing forth fruit, fruit that is from the Lord Jesus, to bring forth um, a life that shows that Jesus is a God who loves you, that we're on this mission. Even more, we're reminded that we as followers of Christ need to pray that we would willingly place ourselves in position of being encouraged and equipped to carry out this mission that God calls us to. You see, we, we looked at John 15 last week, and it was part of our call to worship today, but Jesus said in John 15, in verse 16, he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Jesus said to his disciples, and by the way, if you're a follower of Christ, you're his disciple, you're his student, you're learning how to follow him more, and we're to be sharing that with others while we're learning. But he calls you and I to bring forth fruit. To live a life that shows results, not by my own effort, but shows results because my life is dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm trusting him, and I'm staying connected to him. That's what Jesus is telling us in John 15. He says again and again, remain in me, stay in me. See, he says to, with emphasis over and over in his message, apart from me, you can do nothing. He says things like, anything you ask in my name, I'll do it. I read that and I think, I'm not sure that's true, Lord. But it is. 
It's true. But it's not about you. You know, your praying is never about you. It's always about God. It's always about God's glory. It's about God's purposes. It's about us trusting the Father who knows what, what is best for His Word and His will and His work to be done. It's not about our, our personal joy and comfort and peace on this earth. It's about us knowing that God is Lord of our life. And we should ask the Father for all that we understand and all that we know and all that we can understand and see is good. We need to ask Him again and again. We need to plead with Him. But we also need to know God's doing more than what we could ever know to ask for. He does every time. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Our walk with the Lord, our walk as a follower of Christ, our walk as a disciple, as a Christian, begins with our love for God. John put it this way later on in his, in his, in his short letters in, in, in 1 John. He says this in verse 4, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. God calls us to this relationship where we are falling in love with God more and more. And the love we have with the Lord Jesus begins to spill over into other people. Even people that we don't think we want to see in the store. Or meet on, their, on our walk. The more you fall in love with God, the more you find yourself, oh man, I really care about them. I care about how they're doing. I care about their well-being. I care that I, I want them to know Jesus. I, you know, God's putting love in, their heart, in my heart for my enemy. How is that? It's because you're falling in love with God more and more. It's not about your effort. Our love for God transforms us and it changes us. The prophet Elijah when we read Elijah and we, we read what's happening and we, we look at his life, we see that he understood that it was not his effort that mattered the most. He understood what mattered was his love for God resulting in his obedience to live out the will of God. See, Elijah was called to God to be the voice of God in a time where it was more than just difficult. He was called to be the voice of God when King Ahab and his and his wife Jezebel, who, I mean, King Ahab and Jezebel, they're like the definition of what it means to have an evil rule, right? And Jezebel was seeking to kill every prophet of the living God. And God raised up Elijah. He said, I'm going to protect you, but I want you to be my voice of God, my voice of truth, and to speak hard truths to the people of Israel and to Ahab. And the more he spoke and the more he obeyed God, the more Jezebel wanted to kill him. But God protected him and kept him. But it was hard for Elijah. But he knew it wasn't about what he was doing. It was about what God is doing. So he was obedient. He brought the message from the Lord. And he was clear and he was direct. And he, he let people know that there, there was only one God. And you must choose. Are you going to follow him or are you going to turn your back on him? Are you going to follow God or are you going to follow an idol or a fake God? What are you going to do? There needs to be a decision. James describes Elijah like this. He was a man like us, but he prayed. He was a man like us. And when he says that, but he prayed, it says he knew that it wasn't about what he could do. It's about what God does. And it's about our dependence on God and our obedience to him. And we see in Elijah a, a demonstrated faithfulness because of who God is. We see in Elijah a man who prayed in the midst of despair, of despair and a man who prayed in the midst of anxiety, a man who prayed in the midst of, de of depression. He prayed when he was tempted to be held in the grip of fear, he prayed. When he was at the end of the self, himself, he prayed. He didn't pray fancy prayers. He didn't pray dishonest prayers. He brought his heart to God.
God, I'm the only one left. You know that's an appropriate prayer? God, I don't understand. God, why is, why is it we have to walk through this dark trial? Those are appropriate prayers. And God almost always asks us the question in one way or another, what are you doing here? He says, how are you going to respond? Are you going to trust me? And when we come to him in our honest moments, in our raw moments, the Lord begins to minister to us and he begins to bring us his comfort and his peace. He really does. And he helps us to know that we're not alone. And this is true too. He doesn't release us from what's hard. But he walks with us with what's hard. God didn't release Elijah from what is hard. Elijah had said, I've had enough. <laughs> you know, I've had enough, Lord. I, I, you know, like, no, Lord, be, how, you know, we did some things. We, you, know, you burn up the altar and all that stuff. How about you just let me retire, you know, find a nice little place? God says, I have something next. We need those quiet places. We need those lonely places to be in the presence of God. I know that's true because Jesus showed us and taught us that's true. If you're taking notes, write down Luke chapter 11. Read it this week. I'm not going to read it to you, but in Luke chapter 11, we see that Jesus had again, uh, as we did often in the New Testament, he would go off to places by himself and he would pray. Some passages say Jesus went off to a lonely place where he prayed. Disciples saw this again and again. And in Luke chapter 11, in the first verse, the disciples came to Jesus and they said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. They only asked him that because they saw everything Jesus accomplished on this earth. He accomplished in relationship with his Father in heaven. Through prayer. So they said, Lord... If we're going to do your will and your work and fulfill your purposes and be your disciples and continue to preach with power, we need to know how to pray. Lord, teach us to be in, turn, in tune with what you're doing. Elijah was a man like us, and he prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and it rained. That's what it says in James. God had impressed on Elijah what to pray and how to pray, and God used the prayers of Elijah to bring forth the fulfillment of his purposes in that time. Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. We hear that verse a lot. I talked about it last week, but be still could literally be translated, quit struggling. Is that convicting for some of you? When you change that verse, quit struggling. Know that I'm God. Quit resisting me. Quit fighting back. Know that I'm God. I'm with you. As a follower of Christ, it's important that we, we come to these moments in, 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 in a daily time and say, I know that Jesus is Lord of my life and there's power in the name of Jesus and he's going to give me what's needed for this day to fulfill his purposes. And even though it may be hard, the truth of who Jesus is is still the truth of who he is at the end of the day, and I want to be faithful in that. And to carry out the work and the purposes of Jesus and to carry out our, our mission to love God with everything we have, to be able to love others and, and, to, and to help them to grow in their faith means that we need to be men and women who are being encouraged and equipped and who are encouraging and equipping We need to figure out how we can do that more. In Hebrews 10, 
verses 24 and 25, it says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let's not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another, and all the more as you see today approaching. Meeting together is not about coming to church on Sunday. It's a good thing to do, but it's more. Don't give up meeting together. When you know someone needs encouragement, encourage them. Call them, meet them, see them. When you see that person in the store that you know if they see you, you're going to wind up talking to them an extra 20 minutes that you don't have. The Holy Spirit probably wants you to go down aisle four. You know, we laugh, but he does. We're called to encourage one another. So what, what does it mean to encourage one another? You look up and, and encourage one another, and we, we think of encouraging like, you know, we, we, like we had hoped, like to, we'd hoped tonight we could encourage our Detroit Lions to a Super Bowl victory. <laughs> but it wouldn't have helped them. They wouldn't hear you screaming through the TV. Even if you were at the game, they wouldn't hear you individually going, Come on, make the play. But you would encourage them. Do your best. Find your abilities. That's part of encouragement. You know, when you go to a local game, they hear you, and we see, we see athletes respond to that, and it's a good thing. We remind them, you can do this. You only got, you know, so much more time. You can do it. Reach in deep. You got the strength. You got the training. You're equipped. And that's all true. That helps. But biblical encouragement is more than that. And biblical encouragement is linked to equipping. Some of you know I've coached Special Olympics basketball for, for many, many years now. And this year we had this wonderful young woman on our team who has, she brings some, some good skills to the basketball team. She's, she's got a great attitude. She, she doesn't matter if... If I or the, or the other coach, if, if we tell her to try something, she's going to try it. She's going to give her best, and she does it with a smile. But as we begin the season, this year, we, we start going through practices, and this girl, every time she got the ball, every time someone got near her, she just fell down. She didn't fall down hard or anything. She would get in the middle of the play, and she just would fall down and take herself right out of the play. And... I was trying to figure out what was going on. Well, the other coach said to me that she's concerned about hitting her head. So she had had a medical procedure. She has a shunt in her head. And she was worried about what might happen if she bumped her head. So it didn't matter how much we encouraged her. said, you can do this. You have the ability. When she got people around her, she became concerned and worried and fearful about what might happen. So she just would simply gracefully fall down and take herself out of the play. So I thought about it a little bit, and uh, well, we need to let her know if she's protected. So now she plays with a rugby scrum helmet on, and this girl has been given the confidence, and she still falls down once in a while because that's part of basketball, you just do. But she's not afraid to mix it up anymore, and she's not afraid to get in there and play the game. She needed to be not only encouraged, but her, the encouragement needed to lead to some practical equipping and helping so she can move forward. That's how we need to think about encouraging and equipping as men and women who follow Christ. We need to put ourselves in a position where we know we are being encouraged and equipped to grow in our walk with the Lord and to share His truth and love. And also as we're doing that, we will find that we need to be encouraging one another and equipping one another with what they need so they can be growing in the Lord as well. See, it has to happen at the same time. And that's what Jesus has in mind when he calls us to, to be the church, when he calls us to be, the, to be his disciples. His, his last words before he ascended into heaven to the, to the 11 disciples were this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. 
Literal translation. As you go about your day, when you leave your door and go to the next place where you're going, people should see and know what it means to follow Jesus. It's not about just going someplace. It's not about leaving your house saying, okay, I'm going to go to this destination, and when I get there, I'll share Jesus. It's about how we share Jesus along the way. Helping people know what it means to follow Jesus. That means that we live out our faith in this, as we, we love God with everything, we live out our faith with this understanding that God is going to give me a divine appointments. And may, G, may they see Jesus in us. I hope we're reminded of those things, not just on what we call Super Mission Sunday, but I hope that these things are part of our daily walk with the Lord. See, biblical encouragement is concerned with helping one another embrace the presence and the working of God in our lives. Biblical encouragement happens when you speak truth to someone, and when you speak that truth, you also come alongside them and show them that God loves them, and so do you. Biblical encouragement means that you're willing to take a phone call in the middle of the night with someone who you know is struggling with an addiction and you're their, and you're their first go-to person. And as we do that, we, we seek to help and equip one another fulfilling God's purposes. Reminding one another that God really does love each of us, that we're on this shared mission. Remember, Jesus said again and again, remain in me and I will remain in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing, but love me with everything. Stay connected to me in relationship, and your relationship with others will be different. It will be better. And Jesus says, if you remain in me, I also, I'll prune you. It will be difficult, but you will grow, and you'll bear more fruit summarizing what Jesus is telling us, but that's what he's telling us. Our following Jesus begins with our relationship with Jesus, knowing that we are saved by the power and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our walk with Jesus brings time of confession. It brings season of repentance. It brings times of, of raw honesty. It brings um, times of being alone with God so he can realign our hearts I want to wrap up um, the message today by going to the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And as we go through, I'm, there, there's so much in, in these verses. We're going to look at 19 to the end of the chapter. There's so much in these verses, but as we go through, we're going to, we're going to highlight four different things. So if you're, if you're taking notes, you, you might want to be ready to write down four different things. But <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, beginning of verse 19, says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with, with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold on swervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of the raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who re rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to pers persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back. We and, and are not destroyed, but of those who believed and are saved. First of all, we read in this, these words, since we know and believe who Jesus is, let's come to him with sincere hearts and let's hold on to our faith with everything because it is life. Since we know that Jesus is the Lord, let's hang on to that with everything we have. Don't let it be taken out of your hands. Hold on to it with everything. So I would write something down that would help you remember that. Hang on to your faith in Jesus with everything, with a sincere heart. Our life is in Jesus. Our life depends on Jesus. Secondly, pray and consider how you can encourage your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And don't give up doing it. You'll get weary. Because you'll be encouraging someone who's hurting. People that are hurting do unpredictable things. And they push back sometimes at people who love them the most. But don't give up on them. Pray for them, and as you are able, continue to encourage them. Maybe your encouragement will be, will be a silent encouragement of praying and fasting for them. Do it. But prayerfully consider how you may encourage others. Third, don't treat your faith casually. Man, I, I read this passage, and I read about the warning of you know, taken lightly the, the sacrifice Jesus has done for us. He uses strong words like, to do that is to like trample that truth under your feet. So, don't, don't take your faith casually. Our faith in Jesus is, is our life. It's not... Our faith in Jesus is not a culturally thing we do. You know, it's, it's our life. It's the source of our life. You know, we, we see lovely sentiments and pictures of, of different settings, you know, in our culture, you know, that, are, that you, they, 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 they stir our soul. You might see a nice picture of a church someplace, like, Christmas time, we get cards with winter scenes, and there's a church with a light on it. And you go, oh, that's beautiful. And there's a you know, horse and buggy going by, and it stirs these deep emotions of tradition, right? Or we see patriotic things, you know, God and country, and there's a church in the background. And, but it's more than that. It's way more than that. It's way more than just feeling good about going to church. I love those art images. I have a bunch of them. But they need to take me to a, they need, I need to allow that to take me to a deeper place. My faith in Jesus is wrapped up in this. I may have to stand and suffer for him. There are people today who are persecuted because of the name of Jesus. Elijah, he was being hunted by Jezebel. He said, I'm done, Lord. I've had enough. The Lord says, I have more for you to do. And she's still going to be chasing you. Don't take your faith casually. And, and man, and, and if you find yourself struggling, if you find yourself tempted, if you find yourself wanting to embrace something that you know is not of God, 
Remember what was before that. We're to encourage one another. There is someone who will encourage you. If you need to be encouraged, put yourself in a position to be encouraged. Call somebody. Say, hey, I'm struggling with this attitude. I'm struggling with this desire. I'm struggling. With... Call them and say, pray for me. Pray with me now. Let, the, let yourself be accountable to someone else about your walk. We talk a lot about accountability in the church. Accountability, it, 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 here's, accountability is not someone just coming to you and telling you something that's wrong with you. People will do that, but if you don't receive what they tell you, that's not accountability. Accountability can only happen if you want to be held accountable. Right? We say, that, I, I, I hear stuff all the time, we're going to hold this politician accountable. I'm like, well, how are you going to do that? I mean, you can vote no or you can vote against them, but that's not holding them accountable. It's just telling them what you think. Accountability is a two-way thing. They have, to, they have to receive, the other person has to receive how you're helping them. It's, it's a, our heart has to be positioned to God. You know, and, and, it, and we pray that the Lord would help you to desire to want to be held accountable. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of submission on our part. And fourth, be mindful of the call to stand firm in the faith. And as you're mindful of the call to stand firm in the faith, know that it's not about your effort. It's about your position of being surrendered to God. And the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to stand firm. He will empower you and He will equip you. He will, you, you will find yourself more and more in love with God where the only thing you can do is to love God with everything you have. Even in the face of, of certain struggle, you will love him with everything you have. God holds us, and he keeps us, and he loves us. We're going to close. We're going to, we're going to sing a blessing. And I pray that you would receive this blessing from the Lord, but if you need to pray, if you want to kneel and pray, or, or, or just stand in the presence of God, if you don't want to sing a word, or you just need to hear it this morning, I pray that you would hear it, but the praise team's going to come, we're going to pray, and we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord before we, we conclude this part of our day together. Father, you're a good God, and your presence is here, your love is here. Lord, I I'm, I'm always in awe of how you allow us, your people, to be part of, of sharing your truth with others, of loving other people. Lord, you, you transform hearts and lives. You change us from the inside out. Lord, you show me every day how much you love me and how much you've been patient with me and how much you've shaped me. And Lord, every day I find myself more in love with you. But Lord, then, then I wonder, how is it how is it, Lord, I still do these stupid things? And you love me, and you forgive me, and you continue to shape me, and I find myself walking with you closer. I find myself, the more I learn about you, the more I want to know. And Lord, I pray that would be true for all of us. Lord, today, we, I just pray that you would help us to, to consider how we may encourage one another and spur one another on. I pray that we would not take our faith, our commitment to you lightly, but that we would be able to give thanks for you and understand more, a little more, the power of the cross of Christ, the power of the forgiveness that comes through only you, Jesus. I pray that you would help us to, uh, to learn how to speak truth and help us to be submissive to your working and your will, to be teachable, Lord, help us to stand firm in the faith. And Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name.